want to welcome each person here this morning. So glad that God has led you here to this time of worship, to this time of praising God together. We gather to hear our stories about what's happening in the week and to share God's word, to sing, to pray. And we're just excited that God is filling this place and we just come with expectation for what God is going to do today, how he's going to move. And so we're just glad you're here. Would you just join me in a word of prayer? God, we thank you that your presence fills this place. We come with eager expectation for what you have planned for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we look to it for everything, for our guidance. And we thank you for our friends, our community that holds us up when we're feeling weary and celebrates us with us with the joys of this life. And we just thank you so much for being here with us this morning. In your name, amen. I invite you to stand with us as we worship, as we sing, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. hasn't broke it before, or just being renewed in God's spirit, I just pray that you receive that today. Like a fire, awakening desire to burn on. 
It's good to be together again, and I'm thankful for each one of you that is here this morning to worship. We just sang, God, show us your glory and show us your power. Yeah, I don't know about you, but this time of year, I mean, it's over 50 degrees today, and the sun is shining, and the snow is leaving, and the grass is going to get green, and the flowers are going to come, and the birds are singing. It says in scripture that by creation we can see God's power and God's glory. It's one of the reasons why I like living where we have four seasons. Because I actually enjoy each one of them, but especially this time of year of new life. As we come to worship, in that song it said, you're the reason we're here. And you are the reason we're singing. I think sometimes we forget what worship is. We didn't come together this morning because of what we can get. We came to worship God and to give to him. He's the reason we're here. He is the reason we're singing. And as we come, we bring to him our lives and we offer ourselves. And we encounter him and our lives are changed. As we move into a time of prayer, just a couple of updates of people who you can be praying for this week. Fern Lance continues uh, to be uh, admitted to St. Joseph Hospital in Mishawaka, and they will be needing to make some decisions this week as to where she will leave, go when she leaves the hospital. Uh, she's experiencing a lot of pain and being treated for pain, um, and so our prayers are with Fern and Ray as they walk this journey. Also for Tom Zumbrum, he will be um, probably released about Tuesday. He's currently in the hospital yet in Kendalville. Uh, and again, it is issues of pain in his pain pump, and so our prayers are with Tom and Almeida. Our prayers are also with the Borntrager family. Um, Lydia Borntrager, the mother of Ivan, uh, and Annetta Borntrager Good, passed away this week. Her viewing is this afternoon from 2 to 6 at Pleasant Grove uh, Mennonite Church. Uh, and so our prayers are with Ivan and Jane and their family and Tom and Annetta and their family. At this time, I would just ask anyone to stand who's carrying something this week that you would like to have prayer for, if you would stand at this time. And I'd ask for people to gather around them. James, if you'd just stand back up. And let's have a few people gather around the persons who are standing at this time. And I would just ask one person who's standing there with them to just lead out in a prayer for them this morning.
Father, we thank you for this just really special moment when we can come to you in prayer. And God, we just bring our lives and we put them before you. God, you know all that is going on in our lives. You care about whatever it is that we're facing. And so, God, I just especially pray this morning for those who stood. Uh, but, God, we also recognize that there are many other needs that we carry within our congregation. I just especially this morning lift Fern and Tom to you, and we continue to pray for your healing touch and your healing power on their lives. We pray for each person who would love to be here this morning but can't come for whatever reason. Bless them wherever they are at. And we pray a special blessing on Tom and Annetta and their children and Ivan and Jane and their children and grandchildren as they grieve the, the separation and the loss of Lydia. But God, we thank you and we praise you again for this moment where we can see new life. We give this service to you, Lord. We pray that you will bless Matt as he brings to us your message. God, I just pray that we'll enter into this worship in a way that we will truly bless you and praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask the ushers to come forward. I just have one announcement this morning. Immediately following the service, we have the MYF Fellowship Meal. And while it is a fundraiser meal, uh, it's more a fellowship meal. And so we just invite each one of you um, to join us in the meal following the service. Please join with me in prayer. God, again, we thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us. We thank you for your mercies that are new each day. We thank you for this privilege we have of bringing to you our tithes and our offerings. And God, we just bring them to you and we lay them on your altar, asking for your blessing and your increase. God, may you bless this money. May it build your kingdom here at Clinton Frame and in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you to just stand with us if you would like to do that and just worship.
look like I think it comes with a posture of total surrender in willingness to praise and willingness to serve and willingness to love very beginning of service, Anita asked a question. Or she made a statement, but what would we do if we actually showed up to something and we expected God to do something big? When we read scripture, what would it be like to actually believe that God would speak to us in a way that is life-changing? What if in everyday activities, we expected God to work through us to accomplish something bigger than what we ever could have accomplished on our own? 
So often I read scripture and I see God showing up in amazing ways. In, in fact, I, I often wonder like when the, the, the New Testament writers were writing, especially those who were trying to capture Jesus' life, what was going through their minds as they were writing? You've just spent three years with someone, and now you have sort of a very precious few words to try to encapsulate everything that Jesus has said and done and everything meaningful, and, and you're trying to get across to others everything that you have experienced in the last three years. And so John starts off in this great way, right? In the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Great way to start a book. It captures your intention. But from there, where do you go? What do you say? What stories do you include? In fact, I love John's honesty at the very end. At the very end of the book of John, he's like, I could say a lot more. I could fill pages and books and books and books about everything that Jesus, is, Jesus did and said. But he just tries to, to get those, those real stories, those stories that he's trying to get across to point. And as you read the book of John, he has two great themes that flow throughout the book of John. The first is the I am passages. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We, we know those passages. Those are sort of iconic passages to us. The second thing that John does is he includes these stories about Jesus' miracles, what I call the signs and wonders passages. These are passages that aren't just there to, to say, look how great Jesus is and look at this great thing that he, he did. No, they're passages meant to show those who are reading that God has showed up in the person of Jesus Christ and that God is at work with mankind. And so he includes this story about Jesus turning water to wine. And at the end of the passage, it says, and the disciples believed in him. They had faith in him. John includes signs and wonders passages saying, this Jesus, this man, this word among us is big because God has showed up. And God is working among us in amazing ways. But here's the other thing about this word made flesh. He was also one of us. This morning, Anita and I were, you didn't know I was going to bring this up. We were trying to capture the mystery of the incarnation. And what I mean by incarnation is God among us. That God became man. We were just talking like, what does that look like? Like, what was his human nature and what was his divine nature? And, and how does that whole thing play out? And we had this two-minute conversation. We are like, well, nobody can understand that mystery. Think about the fact that Jesus, while he was with us, struggled with the same types of things that we struggle with. What are the things that you struggle with in your daily life? Jesus struggles with the same thing. And yet scripture also tells us, he, but he was without sin. He struggled with the same temptations. And as we'll see this morning... And what I think is one of the, mo the, the hardest parts of human existence, he struggles with the death of loved ones. Everyone here, in, in some way, has, been, has struggled with that. Has struggled with, with the loss of a mother or father or brother or sister, or maybe even the loss of a child. Jesus dealt with all of the same struggles, all of the same burdens that we have. God showed up, and God worked in Jesus. 
And I think it's interesting to see the ways in which God in Christ deals with our human struggles, especially as it relates to loss. Turn with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. This is a big passage. It's a good passage, passage though. John chapter 11. We'll just start in verse 1. We're going to make it through the whole story. Don't worry. Buckle up. God's going to show up. That should be a, we should make a t-shirt like that. Buckle up. God's going to show up. This section understands my sense of humor. Excellent. Excellent. I don't know what that says about you, but it does. All right. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, I don't know about you guys, but if I heard that my dearly loved friend was sick, that he was maybe on his deathbed, I would go right away. I would get in my car, and I would go. And yet, what does Jesus do? I'll stay here for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, are not there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is then he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had heard this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Logical assumption to make, right? If someone says, oh, they're sleeping, oh, okay, well, then they'll wake up. Things will be okay. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So when he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, right then, has somebody told Jesus that Lazarus was dead? Is it in the story? No. The only thing that news that Jesus has received is this, your friend Lazarus is sick. He's not doing well. Interestingly enough, what we'll see is, by the time Jesus had even gotten the news, he was already dead. Probably a little bit after this messenger had even been sent out to go find Jesus in the first place, Lazarus was already dead. Jesus knows this. Then Thomas called Didymus said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Why does Jesus wait? Why does Jesus wait instead of going right away? Now, for the disciples' point of view, there seem to be some security issues that are going on here. If you find out that your friend is sick, what is your response going to be? Imagine having the ability to do something about it. Imagine having the ability to raise someone from the dead even. What do you do? See, this is what I think Jesus was doing during those two days. Praying. Asking God what he should do. Here's Jesus. By this point, his father has already died. 
Did he raise his father back to life? No. Did he have the ability? Yes. See, we know the end of the story. We, knows, we, we know what will happen with Lazarus, and yet Jesus is there for two days praying, asking God, what do you want me to do? Waiting for God's timetable. Waiting to hear from God to know exactly what he should do. Communicating with God. And once he knows what he's supposed to be doing, what does he set about doing? Going to do it. His disciples try to hold him back. If you go there, you're going to be in trouble. But Jesus says this, no, I'm going there because our friend Lazarus is sleeping. He's sick. He's in trouble. He means dead. I'm going there to raise him. Once he knows what God wants him to do and when God wants him to do it, he does it. He doesn't wait a day longer. He doesn't go a day earlier. When he knows, he does it. Verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. See what I mean there? Even before the messenger gets to him, Lazarus is already dead. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When they found out what had happened, they went right away. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. How many times in our lives do we hear that? If only. Jesus, if only you had been here, if only you had come when I called you, if only you had done things when I wanted them done, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if only you'd healed me then, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if only I'd, I don't know, won the lottery, it wouldn't be in this financial mess. Lord, if only I had better co-workers, I wouldn't have trouble at work. Lord, if only this had happened, I would have gotten a better grade on that test. If only, if only, if only. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha doesn't know what's going to happen. Who's really pressing the issue here? Martha. Like, I, 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 really, this is what she's saying. I know that, that you can work and give me what I want. Even now, I know that you can do that. Because obviously what I want is what God wants. We all want the same thing. I want you to heal my brother Lazarus. I want you to raise him from the dead. She doesn't know that Jesus is going to do this already. She wants what she wants. And she wants it now. Jesus instead decides to have a conversation with her. He said, uh, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, Jewish theology had a lot of the same theology we have, that there was going to be a resurrection from the dead, that we would all receive new bodies, new heavens, new earth, all of that jazz. They had that same belief system. So that was her expectation. That was her understanding. And so by Jesus saying this, she's like, yeah, I already know that part. Now come raise Lazarus from the physical dead that he has right now. I, I want this to be done right now, not in the future. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here and is asking for you. And Mary, as we'll see, begins to ask the same sorts of things. If only Jesus, 
If only you were here, if only you'd done what we wanted you to do, when we wanted you to do it, Lazarus would not have died. If only you'd work from our timetable, this wouldn't have happened. Skipping down to verse 33. This is when Jesus saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Now, here's the difference. Here's how, have you ever been to a funeral where there's been just like massive weeping? I mean, not like crying, not like tears, but almost like that loud wailing. I have a microphone on. I don't want to kill you all. I can show you what what we're talking about here, but maybe, help! No! Why did you do this, God? That's the sort of weeping and wailing and mourning that we're talking about. These were groans that these mourners would have been crying out to God about. Deep wailing and mourning. And Jesus asked, where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then two of the most powerful words in Scripture. So often we read through them. But I think they're the two most powerful words in Scripture. Jesus wept. Jesus, who knows what he is about to do. Jesus, who knows he is about to lay, or to to raise Lazarus to life again, and yet he sees the mourning of his friends. He sees their pain, their sorrow, and he identifies with them. And he too feels the brokenness of suffering and death in his own heart. And Jesus weeps. Just as we would weep the loss of our dear friends. Jesus stands there crying. And then the Jews see this. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Again, that same attitude, if only. Could he not have done this? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. So she's thinking very practically here. Really? you realize that that stone right there is keeping in a world of nastiness, a world of nasty odors. If we roll that stone away, prepare yourselves. I wonder how often God wants to do something big. And we think of all of the reasons why we can't. It smells too bad. We don't want to do it. We're scared. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Lord, I could just as easily do this in the quiet. I could say a quiet prayer, but I'm praying out loud, not for my benefit, not because this is anything between us, but so that the other people around us 
may know what is happening, may give you glory, may know that you have sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now imagine just for a moment being one of the mourners there. Like, doesn't this guy know he's dead? Doesn't this guy know that he's not coming out? And yet, what happens? The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Imagine being there and imagine seeing a dead man walking. Like we thought we saw some cool things when Revive Indiana was here. If you had saw some of the miracles that had happened, we saw a girl get up and walk, step out of a wheelchair and walk. Wow, cool, God, that's awesome. We saw people with back pain no longer experiencing back pain. We saw people who had hearing aids could he now hear fine. Like those are great stories. Imagine if someone literally dead came back to life. Like, I thought I had no words to express the awesomeness of the other thing. I don't even know what I would say if I saw that happen. And not just dead. I mean, he had been dead for four days. His body had started to smell they had gone through all of the preparation with his body to prepare for him to literally rot away. And God shows up. God receives the glory. For those who are willing to see it, God received the glory. Because there were some who were like, what? What? just happened that must have been God and then there were others who didn't believe I don't know how you doubt that but there were those who didn't believe some doubted and some believed we think it's cool Amazing when Jesus shows up and he does something. But Jesus always works on God's timeline. God always works on God's timeline. Now here's the interesting part. God has sent us out. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me so to go forth and go out. Why? Because I'm going to go with you. That same power that I have, that, that has been working my life through the power of the Holy Spirit, is now with you. God lives within us. This scripture says the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We have that power. Stop for a moment and let that sink in. God lives inside of you. And you have power. Like I don't, I don't even know what to, what to say after that. Everything after that should be a, a coming down. It should be a bummer. We should just go home like, Wow. But I think so often when we want things done, we, we say, oh, well, God, you know, maybe if it be your will. What if when we prayed, we expected God to do something? Not saying that he has to do something, but well, what if we expected God to do something? What if when we prayed, we prayed with power?
What if when we did things, we said, God, may you receive glory from this and not me? What if we lived our lives with an expectation that God was going to show up? Because I don't think we, honestly, folks, I don't think we live with that expectation. Not enough. What if, I mean, what if we truly came to church, not because it's like, all right, this is the thing to do. All right, man, I've got to serve as an usher today. I was a, what, what, not because I had to teach Sunday school, but what if you're like, I want to go to church, I want to gather as the community because I truly expect God is going to do something big here. Do you come to church with that expectation? I don't think not enough of us do. I don't think not a lot of, enough of us do. Because here's the thing, the power of God is dwelling within us. He dwells with us. And there is something magical. And when I say magical, I mean miraculous. There's something special that happens when God's people gather. And I don't think we expect anything when we come to church. This isn't where I was going to go. This is where I'm feeling led to go right now. We've been sent out as God's people to do God's work. Do we not think that those whom God has called, he will also equip to make disciples, to bring healing to the broken, to set the captives free, Do we really believe that we've been called to do that? Do we really believe that we've been given the power to do that? Good night. I don't. So often, I want to do things through my own ability. I would go to a funeral and think, oh, he's dead, I can't do anything about it. Like raising that person wouldn't even come to my mind. I go visit the sick and I pray for the sick. And then like getting up and walking out of there, Lord help me. I think so often when I pray it's to bring comfort. Not because I think it'll bring healing. Now, in the last two months, I've changed a lot. But I still struggle with falling into those, those traps of wanting to do things when I want to do it on my timeline, and I want God to work in the way that I want God to work. What if we just said, God, guide me completely? Well, what if we said, God, If you wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I I feel that you're calling me to go down to the 7-Eleven and witness to someone, I'll do that. What if we worked with that power? With the understanding that God is with us, leading us, gifting us, and empowering us to make a real difference in this world. We see the difference that Jesus made throughout his entire ministry. He raised the dead, but more importantly, he gave new and abundant life to us, and he calls us to go out and to preach that. To let others have a chance to have the same power, the same good news that we've received. 
are we expecting God to show up? Because if not, if that's not our heart desire, if we just want to gather as a group of people, why would God do something big among us? going to sing a song we sang earlier this morning show us show us your glory show us show us your power and where our faith is weak just expect it expect that God's going to move and we have some people here that will pray with you if you want prayer to just to believe that that God still is and God is still moving if you're if you just need a word of encouragement or if you have a prayer concern just bring it. We're going to start with the, just the, the chorus for a while. Just worship and believe. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us. Show us, show us your power, show 
for that message this morning. And I just wanted to share a little bit. Um, there was a, a passage in Mark where a father brought his boy who was having um, um, violent convulsions, and he asked about healing. And um, Jesus said, uh, and he said, can you help us? And he said to Jesus, if you can. And Jesus said, what do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And I love the line the, the father instantly cried out, and he said, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And as you go today, I want to invite you, just make that your prayer, uh, to pray to God, you know what, I, I struggle with belief, but help me overcome my unbelief. I want that, that faith to be a part of my life. And so as you go, I invite you to, to remember that. And I'm going to transition here, but I do want to say that an important part of gathering as a community is food. And so I brought some up here today. I have some pretty, pretty good lasagna and pie. And it's been scientifically proven that it's a beautiful day outside right now. And the quickest way to get to that this afternoon is just eat here. You go, you get your food, there's no cleanup for you, and you're done. You don't have to go wait at a restaurant, drive somewhere else. But get your eating done here. You can head out and enjoy the day. So I invite everyone to stay and participate in fellowship with us. We'll also have an ice cream social later tonight where we'll kind of be almost in the outdoors. You can look out the window and, and maybe sit on the porch if it's nice enough, uh, and we'll fellowship together. We've had a number of people that came the last couple of weeks, about 60, so we invite you to come and be a part of us and just join in with us. I invite you to bow with me and uh, bow your heads with me and as we pray for the food. Lord, I thank you for the way that you have blessed us. I thank you that you do wonders, not only when you walk this earth, but even today around the world and even in Elkhart County, Indiana. And Lord, I thank you that you are at work in each of our lives, restoring our faith, building our faith, giving us confidence that you will change the world because that's your intention. That's why you came and that's why you return again. And so Lord, as we go today, may you bless the food that we eat. May we be a part of our fellowship together. May we experience your joy and your life as we walk with you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week.